Ladies and gentlemen, fallen idols, the age of iconoclasm. Alex Van Tunzelman and David Olushoga in conversation with Mukulika Banerjee. Thank you all for coming, for coming to the front lawn for what will be a very exciting, we hope, 45 minutes of conversation. Uh, we are going to try and end a little bit earlier uh, to leave plenty of time for uh, questions from the audience. Um, and we are going to um, start with Britain, uh, but we are going to make this conversation very global. We're going to talk about India, where, of course, iconoclasm has had a very different trajectory. Uh, statues are being erected rather than pulled down, and each of those statues have a story. Um, and we are going to cover both the co colonial and the post-colonial uh, period in this discussion, and hopefully by the end, uh, we'll raise some broader questions about what exactly these statues are, uh, are meant to achieve, what kind of art they are, are there any other ways of memor memorializing uh, than erecting statues. So we're going to try and cover a range of different topics, so we're going to uh, go back and forth between these two very illustrious and uh, entirely uh, perfect speakers uh, for this uh, session. So I'm going to start by asking David just to uh, help the audience remember uh, what happened in May 2020 in Britain that has really popularized this discussion, this thinking around statues uh, with the pulling down of Colston statue in Bristol. Over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh if we can cast our minds back to the spring and summer of 2020, what began as a protest in the United States against contemporary racism very quickly, and I think quite surprisingly, became a debate about history, and in that debate, statues inevitably became targets. It began in America with the removal or the pulling down, in some cases, of Confederate statues, and then that storm of protest crossed the Atlantic, a land made landfall in Britain, the city I live in, in Bristol, a statue of a slave trader called Edward Colston was toppled and it was part of a, a wave that rumbled around the world. There were statues removed in Australia, in, in Belgium, in France, in Germany, uh, in the Caribbean. And I think it was because in this moment when particularly imperial colonial histories were being reassessed, and at this moment when the history of racial violence was in our face with the shocking images of the murder of George Floyd, suddenly we, we, could, we could see these statues, which had always been there, we could see them in a new light. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Alex, you've written a book called Fallen Idols. You've looked at statue making across the world. So this is not just a Euro-America story, is it? No, absolutely not. And I think, you know, we need to sort of start with the origin of these statues that people are reacting against. There have been various points in history where lots of statues have been put up. Ancient Greece uh, being one of them, um, <laughs> France before the revolution. And there's often a reaction against that, and this is what's happening now. So these statues largely went up um, from the mid-19th century to the early 20th century during a period where it was actually called statue mania. So many statues were being put up that the artist Edgar Degas in France said one has to put barbed wire around public gardens to stop sculptors from depositing their works therein. You know, as if they were dogs that were depositing something else. Um, and this was sort of a, a, a reaction to, I think, in the mid-19th century, what was called the great man theory of history. This was popularized by the British writer Thomas Carlyle. The idea that history was just about great men doing great things. And they were all men in his thesis. One of them was not a white man, was the Prophet Muhammad. Other than that, they were all white men. And statues really reflect that history. When you see, you know, if you look in sort of Paris and London in the mid 19th century, they had sort of a dozen statues. By World War I, they both had kind of two or 300 statues. So, you know, really this mania was huge. Um, so really it was about that. It was about promoting this idea that history is made by great men. That was very much, and that's why in my book, all the statues I look at are statues of men. Um, because that is what statues are in our modern period. They're, they're very much a reflection of that world. Mm. So, David, what were these statues trying, what, what was being tried to be achieved by putting up these statues? What are statues for in public consumption? 
I think what's interesting to think about what statues aren't and what the claims of them has been made recently. What they certainly aren't is a mechanism through which we learn history. Bigger statues are incapable of teaching us history because history is fluid and mobile and it's open to reinterpretation. And statues are literally set in stone. They cannot move, they cannot adapt. Also, they were never intended to teach us our history. That was never their function. They were not just statues of great men, they were very often put up by aspiring great men who were thinking as much about their career and associating themselves with these figures from the past and what it could do for them as they were about the figures from the past. So these statues were an elite reflecting other members of that elite as a way of entrenching power. They were never intended to teach history and they were never intended to be anything other than a representation of that elite. Now, one of the ways that that was disguised or camouflaged is that many statues in many countries, if you look at the dedication on the pedestal, it will claim that it was erected by public subscription. It will imply that the entire city put their hands in their pockets and put in some pennies or some kopecks or some francs in order to erect this statue. And that is almost always untrue. The money almost always came from that tiny elite, sometimes it came from one individual. So I think we need to think about what statues did for the people who put them up and how small that elite was, as well as the, of the people that those statues depict. So we are in Jaipur, in India, where there is a, a colonial story of statues and then there's a contemporary story of statues. So did statue mania reach India in the 19th century? Yes, it absolutely did. So um, obviously in India, there's a very ancient tradition of statuary, which is religious, um, but not so much of an ancient tradition of statuary that is secular, which is what was going on here. So the British started to put up statues in the 19th century, largely, um, mostly of people like Robert Clive, who perhaps the British thought was a lot more heroic than a lot of Indians would have thought at the time. Um, and after 1857, though, the British realized they needed to start also putting up statues of some Indians. So they started to put up things like a statue, two statues actually, in what was then Bombay of David Sassoon, for instance, or they had um, a statue in Calcutta of the editor of the Hindu Patriot newspaper. So there were also statues that they were putting up of Indians. But all of these were really about serving this colonial system you know, of making some, uh, 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 making it appear that Indians were part of this system and it was all one big happy empire and going marvelously. Um, however, we know that there was a reaction against them from quite early on. So for instance, in 1876, the big statue of Queen Victoria in Bombay was vandalized. Two brothers broke up to it and they poured tar all over it and broke its nose off, which was a very common form of um, protest against statues. Uh, and it was actually really hard to get the tar off. They had to um, get a professor from Surat, I think, had to come up with a special mechanism. It took them ages to get it off. And then the British passed a law that all statues must be kept spotlessly clean. So there were actually uh, men in Bombay whose job it was to go and shampoo the pigeon droppings off Queen Victoria's head. Um, you know, because you couldn't have any disrespect to these statues. But actually it was, you know, they were very commonly vandalized and often with this method of tar and breaking. Although I do think that's partly to do with often the statues of Queen Victoria were vandalized, and I think we must think about physics. So Queen Victoria, of course, is sort of this shape, like a pyramid, um, small head at the top, great big skirts, possibly sitting down. It's the hardest shape to knock over. So it's very hard to topple the statue, but you can pour tar over it just as easily. And of course, the, the contemporary Indian story of statues, as you know, famously the world's tallest statue now stands in Gujarat, of uh, Sardar Patel, uh, put up by the c current Indian government. Patel wasn't a fan of statues himself, was he? No, he was not. Um, after independence, obviously the question came up of should we remove the British statues? And actually Nehru and Patel were completely united in thinking this was totally pointless. Um, I mean, Patel said in, in 1949, the uh, state government of Bombay, as it was still then called, you know, said they wanted to pull down statues. And he said, you know, why are they bothering about this pointless issue of monuments at a time when we're trying to do so much and establish this new state? Um, so, you know, he was just very vexed by it and very annoyed. And, and Nehru was very much against this idea that you would commemorate living 
figures particularly. And, you know, again, he said, you know, in India we have this tradition of religious statuary, but not this secular tradition. And he was worried, really, that what would happen is the British statues would be pulled down, and then Indian politicians would start putting up statues of themselves. And I think we can see in time that, in fact, this was not a completely misplaced fear. Yeah. And of course, I mean, it, we must mention that another thing that's happened recently in India is statues of Nathuram Godse, uh, Gandhi's assassin, has been put up and worshipped precisely in that moment. Uh, uh, a person, a human being, then worshipped and garlanded as a hero, uh, which is exactly what statues have the potential uh, to become, but have had very diff different trajectories. But as... Um, as pieces of public art, how would you rate them, David? Well, I mean, I, I, try, I tend to use a technical word here. Uh, most statues are naff. They're, they're, they're awful works of art. Um, most of them don't even qualify as art. Um, and it's very notable when statues are removed that almost no one has the nerve to suggest you're removing art or you're destroying art because they are so manifestly awful. And I think there's... there's there's more, there's more to it than that. It's heroic statuary of individuals mm. is about power. It is about freezing history. It's making one statement. It's about removing nuance. It has so many functions that artistic values are very much low down the agenda. The other thing about them is they don't work. On their own principles, given what they claim to do, they don't function. They're inoperable. Most of us don't notice statues. I mean, here there's a very good British example, a, a quite famous example of Trafalgar Square. Um, there are seven statues in Trafalgar Square. One of them is very famous, the statue of Lord Nelson on a 60-meter pillar. It's hard to miss. But the six others, almost nobody in Britain or any other country could name the other six. Now, we are told statues tell us our history. We're told that they are these incredibly eloquent objects, and you just, just by walking past them, you imbibe all this knowledge. It, that demonstrably doesn't work, because we can't even name them. Whenever people talk about removing statues, people have to Google them to see who they were and what they did to then get offended. People have to spend do some research in order to be upset by them, because they don't function. They do not help us to remember people from the past. So on their own terms, what people claim they do, they are... They're, they're mute, they're, they're terrible objects, terrible works of art, and they're just quite boring. And very often also, they're removed for the most mundane reasons. The biggest disaster for the world's uh, fleets of statues was the coming of the motor car, the widening of roads, the simplification of junctions. That's when many statues were removed. Or they were removed because no one could remember who that bloke is. They just became so forgettable. The vaults of museums all over the world are full of third-rate statues of third-rate historical figures that no one cares about. But suddenly, in the 21st century, they have become these, these objects that must be protected and revered and, and, and preserved. We've never had this attitude towards them before. And furthermore, we know that when they are removed, it doesn't erase history. And the obvious example for that, of course, is Germany. That after World War II, by law, all Nazi statuary and all images of the swastika were removed. You can't display them anymore at all. And yet that history is very meaningfully remembered in Germany because they have a proper program of public education, lifelong education, museums, schools, every level. That is how you remember history. You don't need to leave up statues of Hitler to remember yeah. that past. Now, two things that can be said, perhaps slightly to push back against both your arguments. One is, you know, just down the road from Trafalgar Square, of course, is Parliament Square, where uh, just a few years ago, 10 years ago, a statue of Gandhi was erected, right? And it was the placement of the statue, the fact that it was uh, much smaller and less expensive, not on a pedestal, uh, but faced Churchill and Smuts was of enormous significance, not just to Indians, but also to the post-colonial world. So sometimes, maybe, you get um, statues actually meaning something, right? I think they mean something to some people who choose to care about them. But I, again, I think if you ask most people in Britain to name half the statues yeah. in Parliament Square, they wouldn't be able to, and they wouldn't know that Gandhi was there. 
I, I teach at Manchester, we have a statue of Abraham Lincoln because of the support of some people in Manchester for the North during the American Civil War, an astonishing moment in British and American history. Most people don't notice that that statue is there, and if they do notice it, they don't understand the history that explains it. So again, as a mechanism of transmission of historical knowledge, it doesn't really function. We learn history, as Alex said, through reading books, watching television programs, attending wonderful festivals such as this. Statues as educators really don't, don't function. And actually, I have to add on the Abraham Lincoln statue in Manchester, the reason you have it, in fact, is not because of Manchester's spontaneous support for the cotton trade, but it was made by an American uh, magnate, and he wanted to put it in London. He wanted it in Parliament Square. But Abraham Lincoln's son was then living in Britain, and he hated that statue. He said, it's so ugly, it looks like a tramp with colic. Um, so, in fact, he refused to let it be put up in London, and people in London were saying this will actually damage British-American relations because it's so hideous. So they had to find somewhere to dump it, so they came up with this Manchester idea. So actually, you know, often the kind of the path to these statues uh, ending up where they are is not necessarily smooth. But, okay, so you can't erase history by pulling down statues or putting them up, you can't teach, but the whole... The, the pulling down of Colston's statue, which you wrote so eloquently about, David, uh, was precisely to do that, to, to remove any trace of a person who stood in public, who many Bristolians didn't even know uh, who he was or what his past was, but it was important uh, to, for that not to be there where it was. But what people know less about is that erasure was the last resort, wasn't it? There was a process by which a more nuanced history was attempted. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, the statue of Edward Colston in Bristol, I think, is a fascinating example of what statues are and what they're not. Um, it was erected in 1895. Edward Colston, a 17th century slave trader, died in 1721. It has very little to do with his life and everything to do with the elite of that city at that moment in the middle of statue mania, wanting to find a hero from its past. It was, by the middle of the 19th, 20th century, seen as controversial. This is a man involved in the Atlantic slave trade who was um, complicit in the enslaving of 84,000 human beings and the death of 15 thousand. Um, and the campaign ran for decades to have that statue removed. It was intermittent, it was often small scale petitions, often led by students. But it was reaching something like a, a, a peak of activity um, just before the statue was toppled with an attempt to do what people often say we should do with statues, which is contextualize them. So the campaign was to put a plaque on the statue explaining who he was, that his money came very, very much of it from the Atlantic slave trade, but also doing something Something that statues again almost never do, which is acknowledge the existence of the victims. Victims are almost always invisible in statutory. The defenders of that statue were unwilling to allow even that act of contextualization. So the, the toppling of that statue in the summer of 2020 was, as you say, it was, the, it was the apotheosis, or in some ways the perversion of a long process of negotiation and debate to have that statue removed, put in a museum, or contextualized, that had been very strongly resisted by the same elite that put the statue up there in the 19th century. Um, but again, are saying statues aren't what they think they are. The statue claimed that it was erected by public subscription. We know that wasn't true. It claimed Colston was a great and wondrous, uh, he was a virtuous son of the city. He was from the city, but he lived in London. And virtuous, he was a slave trader. So it was full of dishonesty. The statue as it is now, toppled in the summer of 2020, now in a museum, covered in graffiti, it's now a very honest object. It now says something much, much more interesting. It is the perfect object to say, here is a country, the United Kingdom, struggling to come to terms with certain aspects of its history. It is now a much, much more valuable object, not just, I think, uh, emotionally and historically, but literally. One of the lines of defense in the trial of the four kids who pulled down that statue was the, the prosecution had to prove, in order to sustain a charge of criminal damage, that the value of the object had been reduced. 
And so the defense went to experts, to, uh, to art auctioneers, and asked how much the statue was worth now, having been toppled. And it was worth 13 times as much as it had been previously, because it was now globally famous. It now had something to say. It now had a real honest story to tell. So they, the object had been enhanced in value, not, not damaged. Because statues can be repurposed. They can be made honest. So if statues are not the way to go, what are the other ways? I mean, India had its own experiment at Independence. Uh, they were all consigned to Coronation Park in Delhi, uh, where a bunch of colonial statues stand on their own in a very poignant cluster of statues, and you can visit it there. Um, and of course, road names are, are important in India for sure, especially the capital, Delhi. Uh, yes, all cities in India pretty much have a Gandhi Mark and a Nehru Stadium or, you know, they're named after the great nationalist leaders. But roads in New Delhi in the capital are named after forgotten film uh, freedom fight fighters. You know, they were named so that people would remember. But if you ask most uh, Delhites um, who these people were, I, I don't think they would be able to tell you. So in the public sphere, how does one remember history, I suppose, in an age of iconoclasm? Thoughts? Well, I mean, there's so many other ways. And yes, again, Nehru was very opposed to the renaming of roads as well. He said, one day in India, everyone's going to wake up and every single person is going to live on, like, Gandhi Street, Gandhi Nagar. You know, and this is just too confusing. And he was very resistant to having anything named after himself. Um, but, you know, now everywhere in India has a JN Mark and an MG Mark. So clearly, again, that just didn't work. But I mean, there are loads of other ways to remember our history. I mean, absolutely, you know, David has mentioned, you know, books, documentaries, and festivals like today, you know, and these are interactive ways we can remember history. So they're much more exciting and much more alive. You know, museums, schools, through art, through fiction as well, of course. So, you know, there's plenty of wonderful historical novels being talked about during this festival. There are so many ways we can interact with history. And also there are ways of making monuments that are not statues. Yes. You know, I mean, and I think, the point about statues, as I say, is that they really, you know, they vest all of history in great men. And that's sort of a problem for how we view history, because actually the reason the great man theory of history has fallen out of fashion is it's not very good, you know, because actually history isn't just made by these great men at the top. We now know that history is, like subaltern studies in India has really, you know, been at the forefront of this, but we know that history is also made by women, by, you know, by the servants, by everybody, by people in an army, by absolutely every level of society has some role in the making of history. So it's inefficient, you know, a statue is just insufficient to tell us this history. Whereas actually other forms of memorial can be much more moving. And in this regard, we can look at, for instance, war memorials um, are often deeply moving because they commemorate, you know, a whole community rather than just one person. But we can also look at some memorials. I mean, I'll give you an example from Budapest, which I think is amazing, is the Danube shoes. So on the banks of the river Danube, just outside the parliament building is an area where in World War II, Jews were made to take off their shoes and they were shot and thrown in the Danube River. And now they have bronze life-size shoes down the bank of the river as a memorial. And it is so moving when you see it because it's life-size. So suddenly you are brought into this historical event and you feel yourself almost a participant. You know, rather than this didactic thing on a pedestal, it brings you right into the moment. And I feel that memorial is much more effective than another statue would have been, even of some very worthy person. You know, as I say, it brings you into history. So actually, you know, we have brilliant artists in this world. We can do better than more statues. David, did you want to comment on that? Well, again, I would say that the naming of streets often just doesn't work as a way of remembering history. Uh, to use, again, another British example, one of the most common street names in Britain is Alma. Alma Road, Alma Street, there are literally hundreds of them. Um, I used to live on one, and I was always asked people, why, why, where's this word come from? And I'd never met even my neighbours on Alma Road who could ever tell me why the street was named. It was named after a battle in the Crimean War that everybody has forgotten. And it happened that the great building boom in, the, in Britain, in the Victorian era, happened to coincide with, the, with the, the Crimean War. So there were streets named after the gembles and the battles of that war, about which people know very, very little. So as a, again, as a mechanism of remembrance, it doesn't work. But I think there is something, there's something different and where I do favor renaming. Our ancestors made mistakes. 
Sometimes they're venerated. And remember, we name a street in honor of somebody, not to remember them, but in honor. Sometimes our ancestors wanted to honor dishonorable men. In Germany and Berlin at the moment, there's the removal of statues of colonial generals and explorers who were involved in some cases in literal genocide in Namibia and what is now Tanzania. Um, I don't think we should honor men who committed war crimes. And I don't think that's a very controversial idea. But if you believe that everything our ancestors did was right and sacred, then this rather uncontroversial idea of not celebrating men in involved in genocide suddenly becomes controversial in a very strange and distorted way. Yeah. And also telling the history, as, as you've been doing, the National Trust properties, to actually tell that honest history to anyone who comes to visit. Because a lot of this, I and mean, this is the problem with with Britain is it's never really come to terms with uh, how it's going to talk about the empire for the new generations. You have, I teach in a university every year, students arrive not having the slightest clue about their own history. Right? So it's not about learning about other parts of the world, it's their own history. They don't I think that's true in France, I think it's true in Belgium, I think it's true in Germany and other um, former colonial powers. I think it's partly true in the United States. Um, but statues aren't going to help us. We're, we're trying to grapple with something really difficult, imagining history not as heritage and celebration, but as something very challenging. And people who are accustomed to history being something that it exists to make us feel good, history is a much more challenging, uh, much, much less comfortable arena. It's a very difficult, it's a big ask to ask people to renegotiate their relationship with history. And statues are just one of the many obstacles to, I think, a more mature relationship with the past. Thank you so much. Um, we can take some questions now from the floor if people have one. So uh, there's a gentleman. We'll take two questions at a time. So in the fourth row, there's a gentleman in a check shirt. If he can have a microphone handed to him, please. And the second question is the lady in the second row in a blue jacket. Hello. One of my uh, great-great-grandfathers has hundreds of statues erected to him, um, many in public spaces, some indoors. In India, we know him as the conqueror of Mysore. I hope he was not guilty of any war crimes. It's very interesting to ask ourselves how much we should feel linked to these people from the past. When I sometimes point out a statue to friends, they always or often tell me, yes, I look very like the horse, because <laughs> he's normally on a horse. Here's my question. The question of public statuary and memorials, is it not primarily about the question of propaganda? Now, propaganda is a word which has fallen very much out of use. From your discussion, you are suggesting that it is actually possible to redeem bad propaganda uh, so that actually it does become educational and tells you about history. And you also seem to be suggesting that there is good propaganda and there is bad propaganda. How far are you prepared to go in that direction? Thank you. We'll take one more question here uh, in the second row. Blue jacket. Um, thank you uh, for this session, by the way. It was very fascinating to hear both of you speak. Um, and my question is basically, you were talking about forms of protest in terms of tar, um, in terms of um, street names and whatnot. And I wanted to ask you about forms of protest that specifically um, mirror the methodologies of erecting these statues in the first place. So two examples that I can think of is the current movement to rename the streets in Harlem, New York against black women. Um, you know, the latest being Zora Neale Hurston. So you know, kind of thinking on, along those lines and um, the little girl and the bull in, in Wall Street. Uh, of course, not a historical figure, but a human figure who is obviously trying to teach something. So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this kind of re uh, mirroring the methodology, but protesting the, the culture, the, the great man theory of history, so to speak. Thank you. What was that? So the first question. 
uh, on the first question, I, I don't think there's good propaganda and, and bad propaganda. I think there's history with all its complexity and discomfort and nuance. And then there is attempts to freeze one interpretation of history in bronze or in marble, um, which is what statues uh, traditionally have, have, have functioned as. I think in all sorts of ways they don't work. They don't work on their own terms, as they don't help us to remember. And they fail in the most fundamental terms, in that they, they are incapable, because they are not designed to and not capable of giving us history with its complexity and its nuance. So I, I, in some ways I kind of question almost what they have to do with history. They have their own histories of why they were erected and the people involved in those processes, which is often very different to the history that they, put, they claim to represent. But they're, they're almost mute. And I think the fact that we don't notice them most of the time, that we have to look them up in order to get angry about them, I think shows the, the, the extent to which they were part of an historical moment that has passed. To use the example again of Trafalgar Square, the most famous statue other than Nelson today in Trafalgar Square is the empty fourth plinth, which is used as a stage for contemporary art because it's fluid and dynamic and interpretive and it speaks to us and who we are in the 21st century and not to the elite of the 1880s and 1890s, which is what many of the other statues speak to. Yeah, I mean, statues are propaganda generally when they're, you know, they're put up for political purposes, these ones we're talking about, the secular ones, and sometimes very deliberately so. I mean, for instance, you know, Stalin put up thousands of statues of himself, and the purpose of that was not just to sort of um, glorify himself, but actually a sort of big brother is watching you. The idea that if it's in your town, you almost feel like Stalin can see you at all times. So, you know, that was a distinct purpose, and that's a distinct reason why, for instance, during the first major rebellion against uh, Soviet control um, in Budapest, in Hungary in 1956, the first demand and the first act of the revolution was to pull down the massive Stalin statue. This was, this was what was done, um, because it was such an iconic protest. So, yes, they are propaganda, and people do react against that. I mean, you know, can we have good propaganda. Well, I mean, you know, it depends what you want to define as propaganda. That's quite a long, that's probably a whole event that could be discussed here. But I think what ties in very interestingly with the second question um, is this idea of modification of statues. And we've talked a bit about that, you know, tar and breaking and things like that. And, and you know, you brought up these other examples such as the bull in uh, Wall Street with the girl opposite it. I mean, I think there are some really wonderful creative um, modifications of statues from around the world. And of course, in some cases, you know, is it vandalism or is it uh, an artistic intervention? Sometimes, perhaps as with Colston, these can actually elevate the statue in some way. Um, so some examples I love, there's one in Paraguay, a statue of the dictator Alfredo Strossner, that an artist has smashed into pieces and reformed between two large concrete blocks. So it looks like he's being crushed. So that statue is now a memorial to his victims. Also during uh, the in sort of from 2014 to 17, this big movement in Ukraine to remove statues of Lenin and Russian statues. There's one Lenin statue in Odessa. It's gone now, but at the time it was transformed from, if you imagine a Lenin statue with his billowing cloak, an artist did a wonderful job of transforming it with some resin into Darth Vader from Star Wars with the helmet and the, the billowing you know, coat becomes the cloak. And they installed Wi-Fi in it as well, so it was useful. So, you know, I think this is a wonderful example of how you can subvert the meanings of this propaganda. You can change it. You can really, you know, approach it in interesting ways. And I, I'm very interested in this. I'm very interested in these artistic responses around the world. And if, I, if I, there's another example, if I can throw one in, which I'm very fond of, the um, Spandau Museum outside Berlin um, has taken a series of statues that were erected in Berlin by Wilhelm II, the Kaiser who dragged the world in Germany into the First World War. These statues are very often of the, his ancestors, the kings of Brandenburg. Many of them were damaged by artillery in the Second World War. The Allies wanted to dynamite them in 1945. They were buried for many years, then they were exhumed. They're now put on, in a in, in, on display in the Spandau Museum, and they're not on pedestals. And I think very often the problem is the pedestal as much as the statue. It literally elevates them. And when we, we talk we use the metaphor, putting someone on a, on a pedestal. They're at ground level. You can see their wounds and their shrapnel holes. They've got missing arms and missing noses. They were designed to be monuments to Prussian militarism. And what they've become by being reframed brilliantly in a museum by astonishing, skillful curators is a warning 
of what that Prussian militarism led to for Germany and for Europe. They have been completely subverted. They're much more powerful than they ever were when they were on, on their pedestals in the Tiergarten in Berlin. But that ability to take an object and allow it to say the opposite by reframing it, I think that's the sort of wonder of brilliant curatorship. And that's why I think our museums have got an important role to play in the future of statues. I mentioned the big feet. Yeah, well, one of the things that was very obvious, one of the, um, the physics of statues, not Queen Victoria because she's sitting and immovable, but standing statues, very often the, the feet have to be quite big in order to tether them to the pedestal. And also because of perspective, because you're looking up, the, the feet are bigger for that reason. And when you topple statues and they're on ground level, you can really see that. When Colston was toppled, his feet looked so big, he went from being a slave trader almost to a clown. He looked absolutely ridiculous, toppled and lying there with his great size 12 feet. Um, there is something incredibly disempowering in a very positive way of removing statues from their pedestals, which, as I say, are in some ways half the problem. I think we must actually bring back uh, the example you mentioned of Coronation Park in Delhi, which I think is a wonderful example of this, of recontextualization. And this has also been done in a lot of former Soviet states. Statues have been moved to a park. And some of them, uh, the one in Budapest, for instance, is very beautifully tended and very careful, but, you know, contextualizes them. The one in Delhi is, you know, chaotic and has vines growing over it and kids playing cricket around the bases of them. But doesn't that tell us the most extraordinary story about India's history of imperialism is that it has simply been discarded, <laughs> ignored and forgotten now by modern India. And actually that tells us a lot. If I may, I think the question of mimicry is interesting. Uh, an interesting contemporary uh, example from India is in Lucknow, uh, the capital of the biggest state, Uttar Pradesh. Um, some years ago, uh, the chief minister came from a Dalit community, an ex-untouchable community, and she was uh, the chief minister, which was an extraordinary rise and, and, and uh, electoral feat. And one of the first things she did, and that park remains, it's called Ambedkar Park, you know, following on from the previous session on Ambedkar, uh, the uh, chair of the drafting committee of the Indian constitution, uh, an ex-untouchable himself. And it's called Ambedkar Park, and it is monumental, right? The scale of that park is enormous. I remember visiting it on a very hot April afternoon, uh, walking around these different buildings, but not being able to recognize a single person on these statues, which is exactly the point. They're Dalit heroes of the independent struggles who've been completely written out, forgotten, not named uh, in our narrative of Indian independence. And it made a point, but by the time I was visiting it and a bunch of students were with me, um, Mayavati was no longer chief minister of Uttar Pradesh. This was, a, it seemed like a sad memorial rather than a celebration, which kind of makes the point that you're both arguing for, that perhaps this is not the best way to try and write in those Dalit heroes into the nationalist narrative, but to do it in a much more, through textbooks, through song, through art, through an everydayness. Uh, so th that just seemed worth mentioning in the current context since we're sitting in India. Uh, we have time for some more questions. So uh, let's, there was somebody in the front, but there's a gentleman at the back, uh, about six rows down, glasses. I'm not going to refer to your hair, even though you're prompting me to. That's it, thank you. So I'm surprised. This, there is a famous figure that is getting a free ride, and I've seen more statues of him around the world than any of the figures you have mentioned. And I'm wondering whether he's getting a free ride because he can't be touched. Jesus, <laughs> how come the world is filled with statues of Jesus when possibly, possibly, I'm being careful, um, his, either him or his followers or those who, who speak in his name have been very involved in the oppression of multiple peoples around the globe. Well, I think one of the questions you'd have to ask there is, is Jesus an historic figure? Well, of course, that's a question. So does he count as historic statutory? 
I mean, we've been talking specifically about secular statues, and I do think religious statues have a rather different you know, context and approach. And that isn't to weasel out of the question. I think they just have a different resonance. But the, the lines are blurred between these things. You know, and actually, you know, we're speaking in India, where really the tradition of religious statuary does not need explaining. It's very much understood. But also, of course, there is a tradition of religious statuary in Europe. But remember that, you know, that ha there has been pushback against that. I mean, the Bible mandates the destruction of statues in Deuteronomy. It's, you know, you're supposed to break graven images of idols. Um, and actually, some reformist movements have done that. So if you look at the English Reformation, for instance, after Henry VIII, statues of Jesus were smashed all over the place. Um, so there has been a response against those at some points you know, from different points of view. So, you know, I, I think with religious statues, I say, I think it's in a slightly different category, but there are some blurred lines around it. And I think that's one of the reasons that statues are so powerful in our cultures is because we imbue them with some of those values from religious statues. You know, we understand that they are objects for worship, for rever you know, for, to re be reverenced. And, you know, this is, I think part of the reason why they have so much power in a way that perhaps other forms of art or forms of public art do not necessarily. I mean, it's also worth mentioning, it seems like an obvious point, but actually it's not often made and it's really important, is that statues look like people. So when you smash in the, fa you know, if you smash an obelisk with a hammer, people don't have an emotional response. If you sta smash the face of a statue, it looks like an act of violence and people have a very emotional response to that and that's also to do with our religious understanding of them so, so you know I'd say these lines are blurred it is quite complicated and I think it's striking and you've made this point in your writing and others have as well that when we talk about the fall of a dictator we often say fall or topple we use the language of the fall of a statue to describe the fall of a dictator or, or a regime because this idea, this, this personification of a regime or an individual in a statue is so um, embedded in the art form. Another question? Anyone? There were hands up. Oh, okay. On the side here. Behind you. Green shirt. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. Um, it seems that sort of you've taken quite a negative sort of description of statues. Sort of they don't they don't work on their own levels. They don't work as history as arts. They don't work as uh, sort of discussions of history. But c coming very much from a British context, I found this whole sort of debate about should we pull statues down, should we not, very educational. I didn't know who Edward Colston was, for example, until the elite refused to put up that plaque. If they had put up the plaque saying this is who he was. I still wouldn't know who he was, but because of part of the democratic process and the pushback against that and ultimately his statue being pulled down and now, um, as you say, is much more valuable as a result, but also educationally to me, it's much more valuable. So I wonder whether sort of perversely we have, we should be thankful for the statues and the democratic process around them as we're all learning a lot more about our own histories and where we come from. I, th I think it, it is a very perverse argument. I think the perversion is quite strong there. It is quite a stretch to say statues are, become valuable when people who are opposed to them or offended by them pull them down. But there is something to it. I mean, what's one of the countries that has um, presumed it had no role in the age of empire? Switzerland. And yet outside the, um, the central station in Zurich is a statue of Alfred Escher who created the Swiss railway system and whose family were deeply involved in slavery in Cuba and elsewhere. And that has become a lightning rod and a meeting place for people who want Switzerland to engage in its history. So it, it is, it's quite a stretch and yet there are places where that's happening. But I think it does come down to these processes very often are not democratic. They're individuals or they're communities for whom these statues are acts of violence. People who are the descendant of enslaved people having to live under the statue of Edward Colston, I think it's an abusive act to expect people to live with that. So we, to, to, to imagine that they get there in the end and perform a positive function is to some extent to ignore the damage that they do to people's sense of belonging and place uh, while, they're, while they're still up. On the other hand, I suppose, you know, since it's happening, we can make use of it. I mean, you know, and here we are having a good historical discussion as a result of it. So I'm glad that it has prompted a discussion. And I think, you know, that's the thing. Nobody talks about statues. No one knows who they are until somebody wants to pull one down. <laughs>
at which point we actually then suddenly some people decide that this means a lot to them and they must defend it quite often not having even noticed it was there before um but yes i mean it sort of gives us an interesting prompt and i think you know there is as i say i think it's very significant as we said earlier that these statues that are causing the kind of current uh, the current kind of pushback very much date from that sort of 19th to early 20th century period which absolutely coincides with the high point of colonialism with you know that sort of era with um you know the end of the slave trade but this we're reckoning with that era now because those issues mean a lot to us and that's why i think this is happening now it's very much in that context that's you know as you said we're sort of beginning in places like britain to reckon with that history it's quite difficult new generation is uh, is probably much more um, you know has new ways of approaching that, but it, it, these are the visible symbols of it around us. And actually, there's lots of visible symbols. I mean, half of London is built on the profits of slavery and empire, but statues are again they look like people. It's personified. It's individualised. So in a sense, that great man theory is now working against them, in that the great man becomes the focus for all of this fury as well. So you know, you invert it and you end up with something very different. Great, thank you. I think um, we've kind of established, and I hope you're going away persuaded that statues are a remnant from the time when great man theory of history was the, was the done thing and subaltern history has really critiqued all of that. And perhaps we should be a way more creative in thinking about how to remember and teach and relearn histories. Thank you both very much. Thanks. Thank you. We would like to thank Alex von Tunzelman, David Olushoga, and Mukulika Banerjee for that fascinating conversation, which has left us with a lot of food for thought. Both David and Alex will be signing their books here at the author signing um, stall, so you can catch them with any more questions you may have. Their, book, their books are available at the bookstore, so in case you've already bought them, please, you can find them here. And please also help us keep the festival venues clean by placing your waste in all the waste bins placed around the hotel venue. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at the next session, which will be with Usha Uthup. Thank you. There it is.